Hello, and welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. My guest today is a friend and a peer. We first met serving on the Destinations International Board of Directors. We all know him as a seasoned hotel and destination executive from his work with Marriott and Wyndham and his progressive leadership at the Greater Raleigh Convention of Visitors Bureau. But what you may not know is that there is an entrepreneurial flame that burns deep inside Lauren Gold. Actually, that fire seems to run in the entire Gold family. When I was researching a venture that Lauren built in 1995, City Reps Inc., one of the first ever CVB representation companies to serve multiple cities, I was surprised, although I shouldn't have been, to come across an article in the Washington Post about Molly Gold, Lauren's wife. The article was about GoMum Inc., the company that Molly launched in 2000 when they were living just outside D.C. Lauren Gold, Executive Vice President for the Greater Raleigh CVB, is just that, a seasoned travel and tourism executive with a deep understanding of the hotel and accommodation industry and a passion for bringing an entrepreneurial approach to sustainable destination development and management. He's a big fan of Mara Gast's destination management maxim. If we make our destination a great place to visit, people will want to live here. If people want to live here, then they will want to work here. If people want to work here, businesses need to be here. And if you build a place, business has to be, you build a place where people want to visit. Lauren and the Greater Raleigh CBB are doing just that, building a place where people want to visit, to live and to open businesses. COVID-19 crisis, of course, has had a huge impact on Raleigh as it has everywhere. And coming out of this difficult time, Lauren is, as always, focused on striking that balance between internal customers, such as hotels, facilities, stakeholders, and civic interests, and external customers, such as visitors and meeting planners. In Raleigh's case, the purpose-built stakeholder networks that they have nurtured, the investments that they have made in product and destination development, their destination management approach to tourism, and their integration with the civic fabric that they've built over the past decade is a solid platform for recovery. Hello, Lauren. How are you? What's it like there? Oh man, it's uh, it's rolling. It's um, you know a lot of the dealing with a lot of the same uh, that a lot of our other peers around the country are dealing with. Um, we've got uh, some hotel closures. Hospitality industry is obviously taking it hard on the chin. But I'll tell you the one thing that I'm really excited about and proud of is the collaborative work between the state of North Carolina, uh, the North Carolina Restaurant Lodging Association, uh, RCVB, uh, and many of our uh, local city and county stakeholders. Uh, we are all trying to uh, row the boat of recovery in unison, and uh, there's some great uh, statewide initiatives that uh, have been rolled out here in the last couple of weeks that we're really excited about. So today, today is May 19th, and we are literally in the sixth or seventh week of this, depending on where it was when it launched. You're telling me that you're actually seeing uh, some traction where we're out of the sort of stunned silence phase, and you're back into planning with those entities you align with? Yeah, I think we're, we, you know, we're coming out of the response phase. Uh, we're certainly moving into the recovery phase. And I think one of the biggest things that we're collaboratively working on is what is the response from our industry to the consumers, both uh, the visitors and our uh, our residents. And do they feel safe? Do they feel confident in frequenting restaurants and hotels? And again, there's a, a collaborative statewide program going on right now called Count on Me, which is a collaboration between North Carolina Restaurant Lodging Association, uh, all of the CVBs around the state, uh, Visit NC, the state tourism arm, um, the North Carolina Department of Public Health and the North Carolina State University Cooperative Extension. And it is a goal to certify over 250,000 hospitality workers around the state in the latest standards uh, that we're getting you know, daily and weekly from the federal government and the CDC. So I think the biggest thing that we're working on right now is uh, ensuring that consumer confidence uh, as we start to return to recovery. Well, that, that consumer confidence is going to be really important and, and managing not just consumer expectations, but behavior. You're rolling into, you know, one of the busiest long weekends of the spring. Right. Um, you, your weather's great, as I understand it, if I can see clearly behind you there. 
it's actually raining today, believe it or not, but uh, it's, it's mild. Yeah, it looks looks pretty nice. So, um, good weather, um, long weekend. Um, that that has to bring with itself uh, its own set of challenges beyond just sure. the normal tourism, uh, you know, day to day. What's that going to be like? Well, so our governor Roy Cooper has been um, very, I think, systematic, very conservative in the um, approach to reopening. Uh, some of our southern uh, sister states have been a little bit more aggressive in that regard. Um, again, this is a, a great byproduct of state and county working in sync, not only with Wake County, our county, but the other 99 around the state. We are coming out of what they're calling stage one. Um, that'll that'll conclude here on the 22nd. Uh, the state will call the ball to move to stage two and. We'll start to see some additional uh, restrictions lifted as it relates to retail, restaurants, gatherings of more than 10 people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the beach communities, for the most part, are, are back up and running. Um, I wouldn't say back to normal. There's still the restrictions in place per the state guidelines, but we're getting there step by step. And again, I think the state has taken a, a very um, strong leadership approach. And the good news is that most of the counties, if not all the counties, have been very cooperative and working in in um, conjunction with the state, Wake County being one of those, we're, we're following their guidance right now. Excellent. How how are the people of how are the people of NC when you watch them in their daily lives? How's how are they taking to this? Um, you know, I think we've got uh, we, we we base our our destination brand here in Raleigh, you know, on makers and doers, and and I think um, for the most part, you know, there are people that get it and, and realize um, you hope that they side with uh, doing what's right for the greater good versus individual goals. Um, and, and I get a sense that the community is embracive of that. And I think particularly in the hospitality space, we've seen a lot of our, um, our, our key restaurants, uh, you know, our James Baird award-winning chef, Ashley Christensen, she's jumped in, rolled up her sleeves. She's working on a program um, right now with Visit NC that is uh, really highlighting culinary talent and is a fundraiser for the North Carolina Restaurant Workers uh, Fund, which is a recovery fund. So. Again, it's a kind of a can-do attitude uh, with a, a greater good mindset behind it. And that seems to be the general uh, sentiment uh, amongst uh, citizens right now in our area. Well, that's great to hear. And it's and it's really um, sort of heartwarming when you get down to the, the grassroots level in any city and you hear about the good yeah. work being done by citizens. It, it, yeah. it just really fills you with pride. So I'm really, I'm really glad to hear that's going on North Carolina. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's go back a bit. You, you're a graduate of Arizona state, but you came up through the hotel world and you worked at the senior exec level uh, at a national level all the way through. And then you switched gears and you developed a venture in CBB sales. that was successful about right. um, aggregating a number of cities. And then you switched over to lead a progressive DMO in a, one of the most rapidly growing regions on the Eastern seaboard. Is, is that fair to say of NC? Yeah, I think that's a pretty, pretty uh, good uh, description of, yeah, the last uh, 30 years. <laughs> Hard yeah, to believe. <laughs> well, in, in that long and credentialed past, um, what's the most valuable experience as you look at the challenges we face today, not just COVID, but challenges as an industry. Um, you know, they say yeah. COVID's existential. I, I agree. But as an industry, what's the most valuable experience out of that long and, and, and uh, documented yeah. history? You know, it's, uh, I, w I would, I would roll it all the way back to the early years, you know, years one through four, when I started off with Marriott hotels, uh, this was back, uh, before Marriott became what it is today. I mean, it, uh, was a much smaller company, but still grounded very much in the principles of teaching employees, all facets of, of hotel. And I'll, I'll never forget going through my, what they refer to as a sales ID program, an individual development program. It was a three month program where you literally were on property learning the ins and outs of every aspect of hotel operations. Uh, you know, three weeks on the front desk, uh, a month in uh, food and beverage. Uh, I worked in the kitchen. I fanned strawberries. I prepared Greek salads. Uh, I, 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 I spent a week in housekeeping and had to, you know, maintain a pace of doing, you know, six to eight rooms based on a schedule. And, uh, you know, you really get an appreciation. And I think that was what was grounded in both JW Marriott and Bill Marriott early on uh, in teaching that, you know, there are many cogs that turn a bigger wheel. And I think that kind of laid the groundwork for my move into global sales uh, and, you know, how we were very instrumental in helping not only the big convention network, resort network hotels, but the small guys. 
uh, in, in some of our uh, key, uh, you know, asset cities or, or tier two markets. And then that kind of evolved me into, again, kind of a, what I refer to as big picture, or very complex destination selling. Um, but again, understanding that there are many facets that go into a partnership sale versus a transactional sale. And, and again, it, it just, I could have been um, more thrilled to have been aligned with Marriott very early in my career. I'm still very loyal to the brand. Obviously, we represent, we have many different brands here in our marketplace, but um, uh, they've been, a, they've been a, a company that really kind of set the tone for me on many fronts. Well, that, that's really interesting. When you talk about a multi-partnered complex sale in big mm. destinations meeting space, that's really early on precursor to the kind of work we were seeing in Destination Next with stakeholder engagement. It's coming right. from the hotel side. You are literally the first person who's articulated sort of the development of that multi-partner approach to making sure everybody's served, but I've never heard it from the hotel side. So that's really yeah, fascinating. And, and you know, the interesting thing, and I may be dating myself, you know, the old timers uh, in the room sometimes sit around and joke about, you know, how the director of sales, you know, used to call the shots on everything that happened at the hotel level. And now it's more, much more under a revenue management, you know, lens, a yield management lens. I still think that there's the ability to blend the two. I, you know, I understand what the hotel community is trying to do. I understand what the ownership groups are trying to do and how they operate. But I, I really, in my heart of hearts, feel that um, partnership-based selling, strategic selling, uh, very much still has a place in what we do, um, certainly in the CVB space and in the DMO or DO space, but also at the hotel level. I think it's important and crucial and in, in finding that skill set, teaching that skill set, to the, the sales individuals under our watch and our organization and those that are in our community. That's, that's one of the things I enjoy um, kind of helping lead in my roles. So that, that deep understanding of how hotels works brings, when, when they come to the table, you have a great empathy for their concerns and their pain points. You've mm -hmm. managed over the past 20 years to really marry that with a, a destination development model that you've, I mean, you're a humble man when I meet you in person, but yeah. you put them together from bits and pieces of other things. But you really did, at the core, craft that strategy of a destination that was responsive to its constituents, that served its visitors well. As, well, as, as you build your guiding principles in, in this recovery, um, give me an idea of what they are. Well, I, I think it comes back to, uh, you know, one looking at from a, from a sales perspective, looking at um, your longtime account base, who, who have been those customers that we've continually worked with, uh, whether it's state association, national association, corporate. And again, I think the guiding principles of a partnership focused sales strategy versus a transactional uh, focused strategy will pay off because those are the folks that you have kind of gone to and worked with hand in hand over the years, uh, certainly lays a lot of, of a good base of business for us uh, and what we've done. And, and I've been in Raleigh the last 15 years from a sales perspective. Um, there are of course clients that, that have that moved away or economically uh, as you know, we've been able to drive up uh, the economics of Raleigh as a convention destination have had to move to other parts of the state. But I think fundamentally, um, you know, again, approaching it from a partnership perspective of looking at, you know, really listening to what are the key objectives for a client? Uh, what do they want to achieve? What does success look like to them? Um, and, and really trying to bring in all the parts and pieces that you can from a, from a city standpoint. And talked a little bit about Mara's uh, quote uh, in the beginning of the opening. And, and I, I still think that's fundamental to what we do. We're not uh, from an infrastructure standpoint the biggest destination with the most hotels or the biggest boxes or the biggest convention center. But we do have some incredible community assets to lean on in the form of academics, uh, in the form of corporations in our backyard. And those are what I like to refer to as, as our connectors. And leveraging that, leveraging the, the sale um, from a more value prop uh, um, position than just, hey, we've got hotels and we've got convention centers. I always like to say to the team, you know, that's the big, you know, let's stay away from the whoop de doo and being any town USA, let's be unique and different. Um, you know, and it's funny, I know you previously have, uh, have um, interviewed with Greg Oates, and, you know, Greg, when he was with Skiff, we spent a lot of time talking about this subject. And mm -hmm. I still think, again, it, it has major relevance in, in what we do, and it will be a part of the recovery, because I think it's those groups you look to that have been longtime clients to bring them back. They may, you know, have to 
change the scale and the size of what they've done for their meetings, but you know, figure out a way to work with them and continue to amplify uh, what they do and help them find success. Well, you mentioned Greg Oates, and and we did talk about Rally at some point, and he he did really in the statement that he made about Irving, he listed you off as another destination that had quote purpose built networks uh, right. of stakeholders, and right. and his observation really quite simply was destinations with purpose built networks of stakeholders that were outside the traditional um, you know core hotels and restaurants and accommodations into civic life into schools and tech development he pointed out those destinations are faring better in the middle of this crisis in these early Absolutely. phases yeah you you make it sound easy but to <laughs> get to get to get us well you do you talk about working with hotels and understanding yeah. your needs but to get a group of hoteliers a civic body individual stakeholders who own small and medium-sized businesses, rate payers and citizens to agree that the scope of work of the CVB involves work on large assets uh, development, festival and event development, experiential development. Um, that's no small, that's no small achievement. And, and we talk about networks, but how do you build those networks? That's been hard work, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it has been, and it was not certainly the case when I walked in the door in 05. Uh, you know, Denny Edwards, many uh, folks uh, in the industry know Denny from his you know, days in Fort Lauderdale and, gosh, Houston and Palm Springs even prior to that. He, he walked in the door as our president and CEO in 07. I had the good fortune of being promoted to executive vice president uh, shortly thereafter, uh, coming out of the director sales role. And uh, it is something that we've had to work at. And it, it is times, you know, there are times we've been called to the mat where we've been maybe a little bit more uh, focused on heads and beds. And uh, I think we've moved way beyond that over the last certainly five, six years. Uh, we, are, we, we tried a lot of different things early on and we found the traction. But again, uh, I can't speak um, enough about the, again, the collaborative nature of my city, my county, my home state, people generally have that in their DNA and are looking to collaborate for the greater good. So it has been a matter of trying to advocate through economic development, through city and county, through the chamber, making those connections, uh, being proactive enough to ask to, to keynote leadership conferences and talking about the importance of tourism and tourism economic development and, and, and a strategy. There were days where we didn't have that access or that seat at the table. So it is something that, you know, I'm not going to make it seem simple. Uh, you've got to continually work at, you've got to be consistent. I think you've got to be consistent in your messaging and your positioning, and you've got to get buy-in initially from your staff. I think the other thing though, that is important, David, is to go into it with a mindset of, and, and we really, I really try to preach this to our staff at times is understanding that you've got two sets of clients or two sets of stakeholders. You've got your external, which are our visitors, our meeting planners, our sports right holders, our visitors, and you've got your internal. Those are our hotels, our facilities, our business leaders. You know, you, you play a classic middle role when you sit in a, in a, in a DO executive type of seat. And it's something you just got to continue to work at. Yes, sometimes there are some personalities, but we've been very fortunate in Raleigh, you know, where I know in some other cities, there's been some bold personalities and, you know, some, some grinding of the gears, if you will, and dealing with, um, uh, you know, stakeholders and certainly folks in the public sector. But we've generally had um, a city that is interested in growing itself uh, and, and using tourism and events and a lot of the things that we do uh, as, as a driver. Um, and I think a lot of the great work that DI's done through DNEXT and even, I know we're going to touch a little bit on, um, you know, tourism master planning or what we refer to as our destination strategic plan. We've been inclusive to bring in our partners to say, let's build the plan together. It's not our plan. It's our plan. It's the community's plan. And I think that generally has resonated with a lot of people. And if people have felt, you know, they bought into it and they feel a part of it. So I think that's important. You know, I, I'm really glad you said that because when I, when I go back and I read your, your hotel CV, I'm kind of impressed and intimidated and i think wow lauren, lauren really knows how to speak to hotels and that's been a big part of his being able to help them see that the best investments in tourism aren't always advertising dollars often they're they're right. projects but then i hear you speak and i realize sure but that wouldn't be anywhere near enough if you weren't working so hard for the CVB to have a high profile in destination development really aligned with, with the economic development initiatives of the city. So 
in some sense, it's the old nothing succeeds like success. But in order to have those conversations and be credible, you have to have a progressive and incrementally improving success rate, don't you? Absolutely. And I think it is about, um, again, getting, getting stakeholder input, you know, to get them to understand what the KPIs that we're measuring on and, and also ask them, what do you want to see us measure on? What's important to you, you know, beyond just, you know, definite room nights, which we've moved many of us, many of us in the CVD space have moved well beyond that. Um, but I think, uh, again, it is, it is a give and take. It's a classic, um, you know, you do a lot of listening, you do some talking, and uh, it's building, you know, consensus. And again, um, it's a series of steps uh, leading up to uh, something much bigger. And we were, we, were, we were on a roll prior to COVID-19, um, not just all off of our game, but I think we will recover and we will continue to try to forge forward with a, a continued uh, successful path. So tell me a little bit about the civic alignment um, what mm-hmm. we all work. We, we all work in different realities with, right. with different municipalities. Some were highly integrated with the, with the mayor and city council. Some were not. What's it like there? With, yeah, with for us, team? we actually do not operate as a 501 C six. Uh, we actually moved into more of a, what they refer to as a quasi uh, government or an instrumentation of the city and the County. We still, I'm not a city or County employee, um, but um, and that's a byproduct of our funding. But we do work very closely with uh, the county. The county uh, receives all the, the lodging tax, uh, and we also are funded through a small portion of food and beverage tax. But um, the manager and the assistant manager, there's an assistant manager aligned to uh, tourism and tourism economic development. Um, a lot of the usage of those funds, um, the guidelines for that, the seat at the table helping guiding and steering that has uh, been, a, a, again, a byproduct of us having great relations um, with, uh, well, now we're on our third county manager since I've been here, but all have fundamentally gotten it. Uh, at the city level, I, could, I would say the same. The city and the county work under what they call an interlocal uh, agreement. So um, the county collects the money and then it, the distribution of that money is decided by the city of Raleigh and the county. There's 12 municipalities. Uh, within the county. And again, it's, it's the same process. Um, a lot of engagement at the manager level, a lot of engagement at the, assist, the assistant uh, city manager level. Um, uh, you know, I was on some calls this morning. It's, it's a weekly call of the Alliance, what we're referring to as Alliance Economic Development Partners. So it's City of Raleigh County, Wake County Economic Development, myself, and then each of the districts within Raleigh have their own little merchants districts. We're all on calls talking about uh, helping out the small business leaders, uh, the independent retailers, um, obviously restaurants and, and the like. So again, it is um, identifying your key stakeholders and, and getting really everybody to the table. So is, is that a KPI of the modern destination management organization? <laughs> I, I believe it is. I believe it is when you sit back and look at um, beyond just you know what we know is our core of maybe our hotel partners or our facility partners, attraction partners, tour partners, who beyond that? Uh, is is a part of that engagement and and most definitely and I think um, uh, you know again through Denny's leadership and and what we've done over the years again having a very succinct very transparent and public operating plan it feeds into a now ten year plan um, which is also right out there on our website that again everybody had a say in um, I think puts that out there and and and, and pulls down any sort of um, curtain, whether it's perceived or not, um, none of that exists. Uh, and, and it's out there in front and we lead with that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think of Jack Johnson and how proud he'd be that you have a completely transparent plan that's posted and shared. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the work that gets you to that alignment. Uh, and mm-hmm. you've, done, you've done a great amount of work behind the scenes. I mean, you were doing, I think you were in the first iterations of Destination Next when it came out. It's almost, I think, it's seven years now. Um, in 2017, you worked with JLL, JLL on a uh, strategic plan for, for the, at the county level. Correct. Um, and, and that's where, that's where you really do identify that the purview of the, of the destination management organization goes beyond marketing and into all of these development areas, including large asset development. Now, nobody expects that, you know, the CVB is going to build the asset, 
but they certainly can play a catalytic role. I was I was talking to Bill Geist um, last week about the the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Center that they built in Madison, and and right. un, undeniably the, the CBB played a completely catalytic role there. Mm -hmm. But in there, I want to talk about the 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 um, you don't you don't call it the destination strategic plan for Wake County. What do you call it? Oh, no, we don't call it a tourism master plan. We call it a destination strategic plan. And we, we okay. actually, use, and, it's, and its acronym is DSP 2028. So the 2028 is the reference to the 10 year. We launched it in 18. It's a, a plan that encompasses 10 years with a yeah. variety of uh, eight different priorities and a variety of different benchmarks and pillars throughout that, that plan. Yeah. Well, and if you if you search it online, just for the listener, um, you'll you'll find it very easy if you look under destination strategic plan for Wake County or destination twenty twenty eight. It's there. Yeah, uh, visit Raleigh dot com backslash twenty twenty eight. Really easy there it to is. find. Yep. As we as we go into talking about that first question, though, it talks about there, uh, or you talk about people first tourism. What's people mm -hmm. first tourism? People First Tourism, a really interesting initiative. Uh, again, in the in the the great um, work that is sometimes collaboratively done here in Raleigh and is incubated and created and brought to mass market. We see it all the time on the life sciences side, the technology side. We're seeing it on the academic side as well. So People First Tourism is, is an offshoot of the North Carolina State University's uh, recreation and tourism curriculum. And a couple of different uh, professors that are associated with, uh, specifically with the tourism uh, program, launched People First Tourism. It is, um, to keep it very short and sweet, it is a, a micro entrepreneurial initiative for folks that want to engage in the tourism channel that have a unique story to tell, a unique tour. I think going a little bit further beyond like ag tourism, you know, we've talked about ag tourism. But it could be a, a, it could be a craftsperson, it could be a local maker, it could be somebody that is actually a farmer but is doing something uh, very unique uh, to farming. But it has to be immersive, it has to be um, available to the visitor. And P P1T was launched out of NC State as a as a full blown company, and they're now helping us curate what we refer to as people first tourism uh, activations. So right now we're up to roughly around 15 with the goal of getting to 50 type of um, activations that, that visitors can seek out and, and search out and book directly online through visitraleigh.com. So it's, um, it's been a really cool program. Uh, we've got a little bit of a follow-up. We had to take a little bit of a, a pause because of COVID uh, and some of the things going on, but we really want to push hard. It was one of the pillars within the destination strategic plan specific to um, a leisure visitation. Very good. And, and is we call that up here, experiential tourism development, yeah. working with the operators. So it's, it sounds exciting. In that um, 2028 plan though, um, that's that's the far goal post, and I know you. Yes. Uh, I know how I know how utterly buttoned down you are um, <laughs> in terms of getting things done, as well as your right. your creative bent. But talk to us about how you work with that ten year plan on an annual basis. Yeah, great, great question, David. So one of the things that we had to do um, once JLL rolled it out, there was a thirteen month uh, scope of work. Uh, there was a steering committee. There were gosh, a multitude of um, research-based uh, surveys, surveys to towns, surveys to stakeholders, um, gap analysis done on attractions. Uh, it's all kind of spelled out in the plan if you take the time to read through it. Um, the end result of that was to move forward uh, and then start to lay out each of those eight priorities and then what were the kind of the, the, the the guideposts or the benchmarks for each of the priorities. We as a team then had to sit down and go, okay, what is what is realistic in year one to try to launch? So we once we received the plan, JLL gave us some guidance uh, to what they thought could happen in years one to three, three to five, five to seven, seven to 10. And then we went back and looked at our staffing levels, you know, things like uh, the MNC priority, meetings and conventions priority. Obviously, that's spearheaded by our director of sales, the sports mm -hmm. priority by our director of sports. Uh, destination development is really a byproduct of Denny and I working together. But we did bring in some, some let's call it a hired gun. We did, we did hire a director of destination development. Um, we started the, the role as a contractor. Unfortunately, due to budgetary cuts and COVID, we had to um, temporarily um, stop that position. But the 
goal of that position was to be out there kind of on the front lines helping Denny and I engage not only Raleigh, but the other 11 municipalities. And if you look at the plan, JLL was charged with writing a plan for Raleigh, but the entire county in each town has their own wireframe plan. So mm -hmm. we'll hit the landing page at visitraleigh.com 2028. If you scroll to the bottom, there's a series of appendices, which is all the research. And then you've got each town wireframe plan. The goal is to try to get the towns engaged in a strategic initiative, build tourism committees, look at uh, tying into our branding, identifying some of their own branding, really honing in on some of their key assets and or their aspirational assets of what they want to build. And that all feeds back through the county and the county then manages all that interlocal money. And on a two year basis, the city and the county manager put out RFPs for projects. The, the DSP is now our guiding document for the city and the county and the usage of interlocal funds long term for destination development. Building facilities, enhancing facilities, expanding facilities based on a plan. And right. um, we're excited about it. So and that plan, it remains as the, the ultimate goal and you shift in COVID-19, you shift. Right. There may be. We, we talked about this a bit earlier. There may be less resources available for certain initiatives, um, but in a, in, a, in a recovery model with, with, with uh, state and, and federal stimulus, there may be actually more resources available in some other areas on that. Plan. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah we're, we're doing a deep dive. We're, we're just ramping up year one implementation. Um, and kind of the subtle irony of it, David, was that Denny and I looked at each other somewhere around the first of the year and said, man, we may need to pump the brakes a little bit. We're rolling out of the gate. And we're already starting to bleed into some year two implementations. Um, we felt good about it. And again, I think that's a byproduct of what we talked about earlier, having the engagement, having the access to the right people in the community to drive for the initiative. Um, yeah, there are some things like money being appropriated for uh, there was a previous hotel study and there was an RFI that went out on the street prior to COVID hitting. Um, the city is still looking at um, receiving those from the development community. The question is then becomes how long do we sit on it and do we have to go through the due diligence of if, is the money available. Um, mm -hmm. But I still think that there are some things that can be done that are maybe not as, um, as financially um, burdensome in, in all the cuts that we may have to be looking at both through city budgets, county budgets, our budget. Um, and again, that, a lot of that is um, uh, research, uh, obviously unpaid research, but digging in on that, looking at, again, building plans. We're still going to have a huge focus on trying to engage the towns to look at building a structure of a tourism committee within those towns. That doesn't really cost anything. Um, I think most of our towns understand the upside value of tourism. They understand that they maybe don't have a lot of money to put towards it right now, but you can always work on a plan. And, and when the recovery comes, the plan's ready versus waiting for the recovery and then building the plan. Well, and I think I think you will be leveraging the fact that I don't know of a tourism destination anywhere right now that isn't also interested in having a, a stake in the game and a controlling role in determining how people visit their places. So Absolutely. those those out counties that have been, for example, the overflow for your large sport tourism when you have displacement inside Raleigh, they're gonna be equally interested in how those visitors come to them. So it's a better reason than ever to get at the table. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the other thing that's been interesting, again, having this plan, I never really thought about it until we sit it out, we sat down, and we started kind of wireframing all the other touch points um, back to our annual business plan. You know, our annual business plan reads now when you read through it, there are objectives or tactical strategies in there that are that are coded back to the destination strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, there's a forwarding page within the annual plan that shows what we're working on in fiscal year 21 or year two implementation specific to that. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and it's been a huge um, opportunity for us, is EIC and what um, Tourism Economics and Adam and his team has done. And, and just having those tools and articulating that to our community, not only when they're looking at a proposed project, Mm -hmm. uh, but also projects that have been built through interlocal money and how those projects are doing from a measurement standpoint. So part of the give and take, if you're a uh, facility and or recipient of interlocal money in Raleigh uh, in, in Wake County, is you have to report back to the county every year on your ROI. We've helped kind of 
not build it initially. Well, we were part of the original dialogue, but we're now helping solidify the measurement in place for the county and the assistant county manager through EIC. So we've got our facility partners now reaching out to us going, we know you source us, you know, five major events a year in aquatics. So let's just call it swimming. We're doing 40 other events. We need to be able to measure them. Can you help us? Mm -hmm. So we put together an, an, an analyst position on our staff that is now engaging our stakeholders in the community to help them measure through EIC, which we've really tried to make the gold standard for everything that we're doing from an objective basis. So it, it, you know, it's the ability to kind of use the tools that we've got in the industry and kind of tie it all under one central hub. And it's been awesome. I'm going to borrow the gold standard now and I'm going to attribute it. I'm going to attribute it to you. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but that, that was not intended. Uh, to, to it's good. That it's way, good. But you know, it is, it is a good measuring stick if nothing else. So let's, let's talk about destination development. You, you said, you know, we hired a destination development person and unfortunately the situation is, yeah. but as you mentioned, you've been hard at work on destination development for a decade. And there's, there's one particular example that really catches my attention and it, it's, it's in your, your destination 2028 plan, but it's not articulated, but you've done a lot of work to articulate that opportunity. Um, over the past five years, you've worked on all sorts of progressive projects, but this is one that's beginning to bear fruit. You know, the one I'm talking about. I think so. I think so. It begins with an E. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Your esports program yeah. is really, really thoughtful and purposeful, and just an incredible example of how when you commit to something, you're committing to things that in in our modern tourism world can take two, three, or four or five years. It's no longer that twelve month window. But talk to us about your your, your esport development. And the other day we talked, and you sort of said, "Well, we did this, this, and this," and then we started to drill into how much work it was to get there. How did the yeah. e-sport uh, position come to, to be? How did you assess it? And what have you done? Yeah, interesting. Historically, um, we've, we've curated a couple of events um, back in 10, 11, 12. Um, again, I still think we had a little bit of a transactional lens on at that point. We weren't fully growing and looking at it from the crossover into economic development and or academic <laughs> engagement. It was very much just focused on the event. Um, Probably one of the bigger drivers of what was spelled out in the DSP was the uh, presence of Epic Games. Uh, Epic is based in Cary, North Carolina, one of the 12 municipalities that we work with. And it has been nothing shy of a, of a huge global success story. Uh, Epic started as a, um, a, a company that developed the engine that drives a lot of computer consoles and gaming consoles, if you will and ultimately launched into a game called Fortnite, which I think pretty much every preteen and teen probably either plays, watches, or is aware of. And it just was an overnight sensation. Uh, a free game with obviously a lot of add-ons, uh, you know, that, that become a revenue stream. Um, pulling in over 300 million in monthly revenue right now. Um, 45 million monthly players uh, on the Fortnite platform. So wow. that kind of said, okay, we need to really kind of take a second look at this. And as we rolled out the DSP and particularly in the sports priority section, there's a reference to kind of channeling and, and trying to throw a, a lasso around esports, which is still very much a wide open uh, channel and very much a wide open marketplace finding its way. It's been you know around in various iterations over probably the last 20 years. Um, so we dug in and we said, okay, how are we going to really figure this out quickly? How are we going to get to market quickly? The good fortune for us is in our backyard, in our ecosystem, uh, we've got companies like Epic. We've got Lenovo, worldwide global leader in, in laptop technology, but they're also a worldwide sponsor of esports. Um, we've got um, game developers right here beyond Epic. We've got about nine game developers in our backyard. So we really started to look at it from kind of a the little mantra that we've we've coined is play, um, watch and make. Got okay, it. So we've got, we've got demographic and people that play games, mm -hmm. video games. We've got people that watch them. Um, and, and the whole streaming side of the industry is phenomenal. We can get into that as well. And then, but we've actually got folks in our backyard that are making video games. Um, so we started to look at it more from, um, uh, again, an ecosystem. What does our ecosystem look like? And I think it's a really healthy discussion for anybody leading in the new opening markets, any destination out there that's looking at this. 
So we looked at it and we kind of divided it into, okay, we've got an opportunity to work in three channels here. There's the events channel, which we all work mm -hmm. in uh, from an event strategy, but there's also an economic development channel here. If we do events well and bring ga big gaming, big e-sport competitions to Raleigh, it opens up the opportunity for potentially more gaming companies to come here. We've got a great young demographic, tech-driven, highly educated, very much right in the wheelhouse of esports. And then the third channel is academic. NC State's leading the way, but all the way down to Wake Tech Community College and Meredith College, which is predominantly a female curriculum undergraduate program, are all looking to get into the space. So we've got academic that we're leaning on to help, you know, kind of really elevate them and lean on them as, as local connectors. We've got uh, obviously the economic development space, and then we've got the event space. But the, I guess the what really kind of put us over the top, um, and I wouldn't say we're at the top of esports because you know we're still competing with the likes of Las Vegas and New York, and Ron and his team down in Arlington. They've done some great work in the esports mm -hmm. space. We found a, a local, another a local thought leader, a local connector, a guy by the name of Ed Tomasi. And Ed has a 20-year history in esports. He lives right in Apex, North Carolina, one of our 12 municipalities. And he works for a company called Subnation, uh, offices in L.A. and New York. But Ed, by choice, chose to live in North Carolina. So that'll tell you something right there. So he's come in as a consultant and really guided us through the waters of esports and really kind of defining what esports is versus what gaming is. And really, again, look, David, looking at the ecosystem, who are the developers? Who, what are the titles? What are the events? Um, how are they distributed? You know, are they out on Twitch? Are they out on Mixer? Who are the endemic brands that are in the space? And who are the non-endemic brands that want to get into the space because they want access to the demographic? So we really kind of took it from a, um, a ground up approach, again, mm -hmm. trying to carve out an ecosystem and not leading with, hey, we've got, you know, a gigantic Again, no offense to the large facilities out there, but we're not leading with the facility. We're leading with the ecosystem, and that's bringing value to those that are putting on these events or those that are operating in the space. Well, and, and that's a really good point. I did. I had the great chance to talk to Ed uh, Tomasi yesterday, and yeah. we were talking about we we're talking about your program. And I think what's critically important in there is when you define that ecosystem as as watch, play, make. Um, we talked about COVID and, and his first result, his first response was, well, yeah, we'll have to shift. The watch thing will be very different, but the rest of the ecosystem stays in place. Yeah. It's, if you look at some of the statistics coming out right now from ESL, ESL is a big uh, player, both a game developer and a, techno a technology partner to many game developers. Um, some of the numbers that are coming out, they're up 200% year over year in streaming content. And this was their ESL, one of their ESL championships. Uh, the fact that NASCAR pivoted on the iRacing platform and were able to put, you know, obviously uh, NASCAR racers on simulators and got almost yes. a million TV viewers in, in traditional broadcasts. The thing that excites me about esports is, I guess, I guess a couple things. One, there's, there's a lot of um, nuance or new parts of it but there's a lot of similarity to what we've done traditionally in curating sporting events and even to a degree uh, conventions. We're still leading with the same partnership mindset in trying to bring in game developers to hold events here. We're really trying to accent, again, that ecosystem of what we can bring to the table and thought leadership and what's in our backyard. But the stream side of it, David, is, is incredible. We did an event, uh, for our first big major event in a while was August of 19, a game called Rainbow Six, based on mm -hmm. Tom Clancy's title. It's what they call a first-person shooter game. It competes with Call of Duty and, and some of the other games. And um, they did the uh, R6 major in Raleigh. The first three minutes of live stream when they were introducing the teams, the name or the word Raleigh was mentioned probably 15 times. The views of the three days of competition were 16 million globally. Wow. And there were over 6 million hours of content consumed while that event took place in Raleigh. So what does that lead us to believe from a branding standpoint of having that type of reach internationally and hosting a, a, an event to a global audience in Raleigh, North Carolina is the host. And that we're now, you know, in the forefront of a global audience looking at this go, wow, okay, I don't know much about Raleigh, 
but maybe I ought to do, you know, some exploration and look at it. So I'm excited about the stream side of it uh, in curating these live events. Um, but we've had a lot of learn a lot. We've had to learn a lot of things to get up to um, 30,000 feet in this space. But Ed's been a, a guiding force in that for us. So Ed was great. Ed came in in what, about 2018? Uh, correct, yeah. So before that, though, they, I mean, you you know – you know the DNA of your destination, and you right. know that it's got a tech DNA. It's got it's got um, you know distance learning capabilities. How is it that esports got on your radar, though? You know, I'll be honest with you. We we probably stumbled into it. I mean, we had always kind of kept an eye on it. We looked we looked towards the local market. Uh, a lot of what Epic is done based on their game format. It is um, they 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 did the the um, Fortnite World Cup up at Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York. Kid mm -hmm. that won it was 16 and he won $3 million. I mean, more than what Tiger won at the Masters last year. Um, they were looking to some of the tier one markets early on. And I think uh, some of our early kind of prospecting was, well, we're still, you know, interested in population and large population centers. I think as they've, those event curators have it, as they've started to sit down and look at <clears throat> the cost of doing business, excuse me, in a tier one market, um, versus the cost of doing business in a tier two market. That was when we started to kind of level the playing field a little bit. <clears throat> From inception, when this was mm -hmm. an idea and a thought and you and Danny are working on it and you're getting it to the point where you can actually consider bringing in someone, someone like um, Ed right. Tomasi to work on it, you're building alignment. From the time you started it to now though, what, is that, what does that look like? The stakeholder group must be huge. Well, it's it's getting it's I wouldn't say it's quite huge yet, but there is a lot of upside opportunity to make it huge because, again, we looked at it through the lens of what are those three channels that we can really jump into and kind of elevate uh, again, academic, uh, economic development and um, events. And I think when you look at esports, you know, typically a lot of people look to the Mountain Dews of the world or some of the endemic you know, Red Bull, the brands that are in the space. But what do you look at <clears throat> from the standpoint of non-endemic brands and what's in our backyard, you know, from a recruitment retention standpoint and um, helping our corporate community to attract the next wave of high talent, something we really rest uh, heavily on uh, when we talk about smart people in our backyard, curating that type of event that attracts that demo. We also look at, you know, this mantra called kind of, you know, tourist to talent. Uh, and I think we need to be thinking about that in the economic development channel. So by getting the right event that, again, is highlighting our community and our ecosystem, yes, you're going to get the discretionary visitor dollars, but you're also going to get the ability to attract talent to our community to say, wow, OK, I traveled in here from you know, Canada or California or you know, overseas and didn't realize Raleigh had all this. And wow, I'm a big time gamer. I've got to move here to be a part of one of these game developers and or the community. So we've we've led with that, and I think it's starting to pay off. We are in the process of trying to form um, a full-blown local organizing committee. So we're calling it the Greater Raleigh Esports Local Organizing Committee. And there will be um, the ability for corporate entities, uh, facility and partner organizations to be a part of it, to sit in an advisory role capacity. A lot of times when we do local organizing committees, there's a starting point and an ending point, and they're usually put into place wrapped around a large event. We see esports as a 12-month, 365-day endeavor that we think will have um, at least, you know, uh, three to four to five years worth of work ahead of us. Um, but we need the stakeholders with us at the table. So that, that sounds like a perfect um, lateral move in a COVID response and always on 12 month project. It's not as big as anything that it's replacing, but it's always on. I think that's, that's excellent. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I think we need to have a second interview. Um, there's about <laughs> a thousand questions I have for you, but I want to, I want to close on, on, on more uh, gas statement again. If people want to work here, businesses need to be here. If you build a place, business has to be, you build a place where people want to visit. Agree that's, with it 100%. And I that's think what the world you're doing, tomorrow. isn't it? Yep, that's exactly right. She All wrote right. it, we're living it. There it is. Yep. Thank you, Mara. Um, in closing, any words to share with your peers? Stick to it. Um, you know, it, it is a trying time for all of us. We're in you know, unprecedented waters, and I think everybody has said that a thousand times over. But um, know that at the end of the day, we're a, 
we're a big little industry. Lean on your peers, talk to your peers, not only in your city, on your staff, but either across the country or you know even into other countries. Uh, lean on each other for advice, for counsel, um, to pick each other up um, for business advice, but even personal advice. And um, I'm hoping we can get to a point where we're not having headsets on, we can all get haircuts um, and uh, we can be together soon. Uh, I think that would be, uh, I think that would make a lot of people happy. It's something as simple as just gathering again, I think will be, um, will be huge for all of this. Uh, be good medicine moving forward. It, it, it will. Lauren, it's, it's been really great to talk to you and, and I've really enjoyed it. I think we met about six, seven years ago and uh, it's, it's been remarkable to, to watch the work you're doing. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for sharing with us. And I, and I do think we need to have you back. There's a part two to this one. Excellent. Thank you, David. <laughs>